It's been a while since I've talked in a setting like this, and um, Adrian roped me in to uh, to give my thoughts on how how we treat the illnesses that are treated today uh, at Sovereign, a and also some ideas, perhaps some of it a little controversial, um, so that we can start thinking about what we, what we do. I want to talk about brain function, and, and I'll tell you why I think it's important, why I think it should be the central focus of what we do in addiction and, and also mental health, but I'll leave out the mental health part of it. I have been very interested in cognitive function and brain function for quite a while. Um, what I want to do in this time is to look at what are the problems in terms of cognitive function within the substance abuse field, but also that applies to behavioral addiction uh, as well, like, like gambling and, and sex addiction, because the, the circuits are, are, are really the same uh, as you probably probably know. And then we'll talk about different models in which people are conceptualizing the, the illness uh, or this group of illnesses. Uh, and then I'll give you some thoughts as to what we should be, what we might do to, uh, to remedy these, these effects. Mental health and substance abuse has gained parity. The question is, are we, questions we need to ask ourselves is, are we at par with OBGYN with surgery uh, and the other disciplines in terms of our treatment. I won't spend too much time on this. Most of you know these circuits in the brain. There are these neurons, there's a, the ventral tegmental area, which is important in terms of the uh, emotional side of things. Um, there's this thing called you know, cold cognition and hard cognition. Cognition is how we process information or things like memory and attention. So cold cognition is you know, the, the ability to process information, memory, attention, and then the so-called hot cognition is what is important in terms of being human. That's the, the social cognition part of it, attributing a mental state to somebody else. How do I know you're angry? How do I know you're sad? It's because I look at your facial expression and then that allows me to see how I should react accordingly. There are several models of, of the illness and here I want to really concentrate on how we might be able to look at the cognitive model. Not to the exclusion of everything else but to see well there, there is evidence to show that people relapse because of a variety of things people, and then the the issue is what parts of the brain are involved in, in relapse. We need to distinguish behavior from brain function. Behavior is a result of what goes, it's an end stream product of what goes wrong in the brain. So cognitive dysfunction, I would propose to you that we are looking at the wrong thing. That cognitive dysfunction is the core and enduring feature of the illness itself. Because people do not lose much of their verbal skills, we don't pick it up. But there are massive, in some cases, there are massive changes in memory, in attention, um, in problem solving, and I'll show you some examples of that, in forward planning, um, so, and in reasoning. So the question is, why don't, we, why don't we pick this up? In fact, if you did a checklist for a for attention deficit disorder in the patients in on the in your facility or in your clinic there would be over 50, you know 30 to 40 percent of people would fulfill criteria for ADHD the question is they haven't been assessed for ADHD and they haven't got treatment for ADHD the, que the, the, the question then arises are these people self-medicating what happens if you treat the primary problem that they have? Is addiction the secondary problem? Why is this person going on from one treatment center to the other or readmitting each time? When people readmit, it is not a failure of that person. It is the failure of our treatment. When somebody gets high blood sugar or they have high blood pressure and need to get into hospital, 
Do you think it's the failure of the person that has the illness? There's always this attribution, oh, they relapse and they failed. Well, no, we failed in our treatment because we were not able to ensure that they had adequate care going forward, whether it was a handoff to the other person in terms of primary care or to an IOP clinic somewhere else. So I think we need to shift that responsibility onto the treatment centers. Here is another model which looks at the different types of cognitive processing. We have two types. Things are automatic. Some of the things we do are automatic. They are, and the others are, are controlled. You, you drove here today, and if you've, if you've come to Costa Mesa or to the center club in the past, you didn't give it much thought. You, you, you drove and you got off at the right exit. So there are things like procedural learning that we do every day that is learned behavior, and you're using your brain function, you're coordinating, you're talking on the phone, you're doing many, many, many things, hopefully on a hands-free, but <laughs> they, you're parallel processing unconsciously. So that's automatic behavior. The other thing you're doing is forward planning. What are you, you, have, you, you decided that you're going to come here. Well, you need to plan, you need to leave on time, you need to get ready. All of that is forward planning. These things we do on an automatic basis every day in our lives. However, and it's also called executive function. I don't know why psychologists call it that. It's got nothing to do with executives, whether it's less or more, who knows. But reasoning and problem solving is extremely important. And the other important aspect of cognitive function is working memory, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. So again, these slides will be available, so I, I don't want to spend too much time on it. It's about how the processes go together in the pre-consumption state and the post-consumption state. What about the cognitive processing model? Here is, we are talking about that automatic processing and just in terms of alcoholism and, and drinking. Um, if you think of it, a lot of the people that experimented with drugs or have taken drugs abroad, certainly, uh, in the data from the uh, veterans uh, come to mind. Uh, they don't come back and all become addicts. There are people who are able to stop. Um, people who had started taking med drugs because of certain situations and stressful situation have, um, there was a report, I think a couple of days ago, saying that uh, a lot of the troops were taking marijuana as uh, self-medication. Um, the question is, does everybody then get addicted? What prevents somebody from getting addicted? We have seen cognitive function as a result, as an effect of addiction. I would propose to you that the impairment in cognition may be even responsible for developing uh, addiction. The ability to choose, the ability to control our impulses, the ability to problem solve and look at consequences is different for different people. And apart from the genetic vulnerability as shown by twin studies, you've got, you've got a situation whereby there are certain people that are exposed to the same amount of stimuli, one develops an, one develops an addiction and the other doesn't. Why somebody develops the illness? And, um, and it, I would propose to you that it, if we did studies, perhaps, like people do in, in schizophrenia, we're look at, looking at the prodrome of developing an addiction. <coughs> there seems to be some evidence that cognitive dysfunction may even be responsible in a subset of people for the development of addictive behavior. So, as I mentioned, it's about self-regulation, impaired control over our actions, and then the issue of immediate reward over uh, further benefits. There's a very interesting study done by Stanford University called the Marshmallow Test. So you might want to look that up. I, I don't have a slide on it. It's, it's about looking at children who are given marshmallows and people who are able to, the, the children who were, uh, they were then told not to eat those marshmallows and then the adults left the room. So there's a number of, and, and so you, the people who, or the kids, that could not resist eating those marshmallows had much lower income, poorer education, and didn't do as well in life. As this was almost 11 years later, 
and then another 15 or 17 years later. So it shows you that the ability to delay reward is extremely important um, in terms of our uh, career paths and, and what we do. I just wanted to list out, rather than go through all the cognitive dysfunction, list out the cognitive dysfunction that you may see. I've talked to you about not everybody is impaired cognitively to a very large extent. So you've got to see, well, however, the majority of people that take drugs and, and uh, have a substance abuse problem or dependence problem do have cognitive defects or uh, deficits when you, when, you treat, when you assess them. So attention executive function, as I mentioned, which is reasoning and problem solving, learning and memory, and then visuospatial ability, postural stability, it seems is, is less important. What is not shown here is working memory, which I'll, which I'll, uh, which I'll come to. Are these rows uh, horizontal or vertical? <laughs> yes. Well, you initially see them as horizontal, start seeing them as vertical. It depends on how you process information. We all process information in different ways. Um, some of you saw this. As, as vertical to start with and then as horizontal rows. So individual differences obviously are very important in this. So I wanna talk about working memory. Working memory is really important. We use this all the time. It's essentially what makes us human apart from social cognition. It is the ability to keep information online for short periods of time. And there are two schools of thought which is more academic, I won't go into it. Alan Badley is from the University of Bristol at that time versus Patricia Goldman Rakish, who's, who was at, at Yale. Well, Golden, uh, Goldman Rakish felt that you only keep information online and that's working memory. Whereas Alan Badley from Bristol in the UK said that you have to manipulate that information. And I'm trying to explain this to you because this is really important in terms of what we're going to talk about. Working memory, I don't know why they called it working, all, all memory seems to be working. But essentially it is a limited space that we have in our brains where we store information for very short periods of time. Think of it as the RAM in your computer. It's short-term memory. If you haven't saved that to your hard drive, which is the equivalent of the hippocampus, then the, you will lose that information if you shut your computer. So it's no longer there unless you know, computers now have autosave functions. But in any case, the issue is that we cannot, our, there is information overload. You know, irrespective of social media. They, we get a lot of information coming to us. We need an ability to take that information, filter it out, and throw it out, and not, not transfer it to a long-term storage. Otherwise, you can imagine, as the hard disk, it will completely fill up very quickly if you stored all the information that you get. So it's a short-term, capacity-limited storage that allows us to take information. So for those of us old enough that know about the yellow pages when it was still on the paper <laughs> and, and books and in telephone booths that were before the mobile phones, I guess, just showing your age. Um, you would look up a number on the yellow pages and you would walk to the phone. And what you're doing is you're keeping that information in mind and you are, you are reverberating that number. Suppose you dial the number and it's engaged and if you don't have a redial button, you've forgotten that number. Why? Because you are no longer keeping it in your phonological loop. And that's what, what it was. And we use this all the time. It's central to all function that we have. That there's a visuospatial scratch pad, which is where the scratch pad, think of it like any scratch pad that is you know, erasable, if you like. And so that's what you did with the yellow pages. Then the central executive that's there, and then you kept that reverberating that number. And so this is what working memory is. And we use it all the time. And we tested this in several functional MRI studies, and I wasn't involved in this study. This is from Dr. Kumari in biological psychiatry, where she was looking at, really for the first time, the brain, uh, the changes in brain function um, uh, of cognitive behavior therapy. So, but I just wanted to tell you what the test is that, that had been designed, that you need to remember something that was one back, so you, it increases in level of difficulty. And then executive function. I would need to define this, and we'll quickly go through it. 
it's shifting, set shifting. We need to, if you're concentrating on something now, you need to shift your attention to something else. So the ability to shift your set is really important. And, and constant updating and monitoring. And this is how we do this. And then uh, how we navigate through life. And then response inhibition. Response inhibition is a really important part because that keeps us uh, sane, it keeps us on the right side of the law. So the Wisconsin card sorting test is one example, I'm not gonna go through it. It's an example of how we measure executive function, how we measure set changing. So there are tests that are, that are there, computerized and otherwise, and some of this we created in, in, in cog test. So this is the Tower of London test. It's a, it's a test of your executive function. So what would you need, how many moves would it take to get the the top line similar to the bottom line. What you're doing is you're organizing this information, you're planning, and you're saying, how do I make this identical? Okay, so response inhibition, the go, no go task and the Stroop task, these are really important to, in terms of testing people, and these are tests that you do on the computer. Everybody that is there should be getting these tests, and, and we're developing some software. We hope that we can make this available to everybody that and you don't need a you know esteemed psychologist like Dr. Milley who's standing there in the in the corner uh, to to be carrying out these tests. A lot of the treatment centers that are there should be able to assess cognition and the software de we're developing. We want to we want to ensure that we raise the bar in the in this industry. I'd like us to work through this as a group. I mean, like groups, don't we? Um, so and. I want you to ignore the word, but tell me the color. Here you have to inhibit a response. You have to in inhibit that automatic response of saying green, and then you've got to process that information. This is what we are testing. This is where people with addiction have a problem. And then I'll talk about how we address these issues. But first of all, you have to measure. And then this brings me to something really important. I think we need to move away from the sort of assessments that we are doing. We are, <coughs> we, we are putting people in process groups. Uh, we, we have a BPS that is done, and then somebody says, okay, now you get, need to get into treatment uh, after you have had the BPS uh, done. Now, imagine going to your family practitioner, and you tell, you tell your doctor, um, I'm, I'm feeling dizzy when I, when I wake up. I, I have problems with my, uh, with my arms sometimes, and I, I feel, uh, I, I feel uh, nauseated from time to time. And he takes a full, he or she takes a full history and gives you blood pressure tablets to take. Would you take these tablets? Uh, he's only taken a history and done nothing else with you. So. For me, it will be a little difficult, like Dr. Drew says. This is not something that we would do. How is it that in addiction, we put people into a process group when we don't know whether their brain can process information? How is it that we consider this to be a brain illness and all we do is take a history it's equivalent to your family practitioner asking you about your symptoms. Yes, do you feel dizzy? Yes. You know, have you got a family history of blood, high blood pressure? Yes. Well, now take these tablets. We wouldn't take these tablets. So how is it on the basis of just the history, we, which, is an, a, you know, the, which is what the BPS actually, the biopsychosocial, for those of you who are not aware of the acronym, the biopsychosocial, we do that and then we put people into a process group, we put people into therapy. If this is a brain illness, let us start measuring brain function. This is the core and enduring feature of the illness itself. Why do you think people relapse constantly? Because we are not treating the right thing. The right thing, which is the core and enduring feature of the illness, is cognitive dysfunction. And that is related to functional outcome. How you might be able to improve that. Otherwise, you're really arranging deck chairs on the Titanic. You know, there, there is little progress that we are making in terms of treatment. Of course, there is, you know, one could be parsimonious and talk about, well, there's a financial incentive, somebody comes in. 
No, you, if you want good outcomes, and, and we will be judged as, an, as a community, as the, as the industry and, and the speciality becomes mature and comes out of the backwaters, it's not enough to get parity. We have to behave and act like we are at par. At present, we are not at par. However, we want to talk about it. So cognitive neuroscience is really important. Function MRI is something I've done for, for a while. Uh, haven't over the last eight years or so. But it allows you to peer inside the brain and then really look at what are the changes in blood flow in a very brief way of explaining this. What are the changes in blood flow in relation to cognitive tasks? So what you see in, in numbers in a, in a psychometric test or a cognitive test, you see that uh, in, in, the, in the brain. So this is just one example in terms of cocaine craving. You would see that there are certain areas of the brain that are, this is the, amyg this is the anterior cingulate, the, sorry, amygdala anterior cingulate. The anterior cingulate is that part of the brain that's right in, very extremely rich in dopamine function. And when people are showed a video of sort of nature, this is the activation. When people are shown, that same people are shown an activation of the cocaine video, the activation is different. I don't want to dwell on this, but I just want to tell you that there, there is sufficient evidence now while peering into the brain using the latest techniques to show that there is abnormality of the brain. And we continue to ignore this, and we will ignore this at our peril. At one point, things are going to catch up with us in terms of saying, well, what are the issues in, in addiction and why aren't we assess, uh, addressing them? Assessing them, first of all, what you can't measure, you cannot improve or cannot change. So we must go from our usual method of treat or uh, of assessing addiction and treating addiction to a measurement-based method of practice that we need to measure symptoms. So at, at Sovereign, we are putting together our effort, it's not complete as yet, of measuring psychopathology. There are three things that you have. One is symptoms, which is psychopathology, that uh, whether it's mental health or, or, or addiction. Uh, the second is the brain waves that you have as measured by the EEG, psychophysiology or neurophysiology, and third is cognitive function, which is what we are talking about. We're attempting to quantify all of that. We need the blood sugar equivalent. We need the blood pressure equivalent in our specialty if we are going to show a change. People talk about outcome or what is the outcome of, your, of the patient, and they have a very horrible uh, measure in terms of relapse. Relapse depends on thousands of things that are outside one's control once uh, the patient has left treatment. What you need to measure is how good are you doing in terms of treatment? How good are you, are you able to assess the patients? Are you able to then address those individual issues? And do you have a graph as they have, when, when if you, you know, if you're unfortunate to have diabetes or one of these illness, you would keep a graph of your blood sugar, would you not? So why don't we empower our patients and give them a graph of their symptoms? They will comply much more. You'll have a much lower AMA rate or ACA rate, as you want to call it, people leaving treatment before you think they are ready to leave because you make them partners in, in treatment. So just like you would do with your blood pressure or diabetes, it's not an adversarial relationship. It's a partnership. So instead of, instead of having uh, behavioral contracts, you know, Craig Young has now uh, uh, introduced recovery agreements. So it's not as if we are imposing as the therapist or the, the, the psychologist. You're not um, imposing our view on the patient. The patient is then, or client if you want to call them that, they, uh, is a partner in treatment as you would do with COPD, as you would do with Parkinson's disease, heart disease. The basic assumptions here is executive control is the basis of regulation for all human action. And then recovery from addiction, I would argue, is impeded by the cognit cognitive deficits that we not only not treat or, or address in any way, we don't even measure them. So if I were a diabetic specialist, I would, you know, if I don't measure blood sugar, 
that would be negligence. So we are doing things, again, as I tell you, that are not at par. And as a, a community, we need to come up to that level where we say we are really at par. It's not enough to say, okay, now lots of people have insurance, let's just treat them without any measurement whatsoever. You need to measure what you do, then only can you change it, then only can you improve it, if that is the case. So that's why my argument is that these are potential targets. If something is hampering recovery, it is not the, just the way they're thinking. Their brain, they've got a brain dysfunction. I think we need to just accept that there's overwhelming evidence for that now, both in terms of you know, neuropsychological testing as well as functional MRI. Dopamine, it's nice in terms of reward. Everything from chocolates to drugs to amphetamines to sex, everything. It, it pours dopamine into the front lobe. And then, you know, the serotonin is your hugging kind of hormone that you, uh, neurotransmitter that you might have. Both dopamine and nicotine, interestingly, uh, for in the very short time for nicotine, you have to inject it, a lot of it, intravenously. So, you know, smokers do not have a great memory. They, for dopamine, this is really important that if you have people taking that, that have an increase in dopamine, then the cognitive function improves as well in the very, very short term, and then it kind of burns out. And these are two studies done in both in the UK in terms of using the uh, stroop, the, the, the inhibition paradigm I showed you, one of them uh, used that. And there's evidence that there are problems with the people that have uh, addiction. So attentional bias, and this is what I want to talk about, it prioritizes cue detection. A cue might be a bottle of alcohol, for example. And then that goes into your memory system. And then so you are preoccupied thereafter with these salient cues uh, all the time. And so here is, the, here is the model that you have where you have the memory system, and this is not Coca-Cola we're talking about uh, on top there. So um, the prefrontal cortex is that area of the brain responsible usually for executive function, area 9 and 46, with executive function and working memory. So this is sort of the higher level of processing. This is in our neocortex, which is sort of the new brain, if you like, even though we're speaking in many, many, uh, in, in many, many evolutionary years. And then nucleus accumbens, which uh, really is <coughs> responsible for your pleasure system, reward system, and drug seeking in there. And these are the neurotransmitters that go about doing this. And then this is a complicated slide, but I just want to show you there's an interaction between the neurotransmitters, cognitive function, and hormones that are there. Just to tell you this, we are, you know, are we the product of our genes? And then we are helpless beyond all of that? Um, or does nature, uh, uh, sorry, nurture and the environment have equal responsibility? So the issue of behavioral phenotypes rather than just genotypes. Um, because this is really important. We are passing a judgment on people without any evidence, and that is dangerous. You cannot do that. Uh, there are different therapeutic strategies that are there. I just want to touch on one before I, before I end. People in addiction have always got the reward radar on. They, they, they would want to, you, you see how many people replace you know, sex with substance abuse or substance abuse with sex in treatment. So you, it is important to understand that it's the same neural circuitry, obviously, that is, uh, that is involved. And, and they are just replacing one thing with the other so that they get their uh, dopamine up and running. So we talked about research and the lab, et cetera. How does this help? We are not, you know, I used to work in an Ivy League, no longer so. So how do you convert or how do you take rational research and turn it into clinical reality? How can we do that for, for our patients, for our treatment centers? Um, so as I said, there are enough studies now um, beyond reasonable doubt in terms of saying that there are attentional biases and there are cognitive dysfunction in, in uh, addiction. If you have the cognitive behavioral model, which is what we've had for this long. Um, we, the main issue there is addiction is seen as compensatory.
to the illness. Uh, and then uh, dysphoria precedes drug use. And this is what this model is, is about. And then if you look at a new neurobehavioral model, which is more, in, don't let this cognitive behavioral model, you know, it's not about cognition, even though it's called cognitive behavioral and there is cognitive restructuring. There's no assessment of, of cognition there. So what I would say is if, if addiction is primary rather than secondary to the dysphoria, and then you're saying, we're saying that dysphoria is as a consequence of drug use. There's hypervigilance in there. And there, there are problems in memory systems. None of these assumptions are made in the current model, which is the most, you know, what, what is the model you're following? Everybody, most people say like a CBT model that is, is what we have. Now, the question is, the therapeutic implications are different. The therapeutic implications of the current model is changing your lifestyle, whereas here it would be reversing the cognitive deficits because it depends on if, you, if we continue to ignore the evidence and we ignore this at our peril, at some point we're going to be asked uh, to answer for the lack of, the, why do we have such a bad it, you know, response rate or, or, or such a high relapse rate, the 50% relapse within six months or earlier. So relapse prevention skills. So we have relapse prevention groups. We te teach people about relapse. But what is, does the literature tell us? The literature tells us that these things, the skills that we're telling, teaching people are not helping them. Because, you know, coming back to it, they're, if they're unable to process and retain information, what is therapy? Therapy is about listening to your therapist processing that information and the ability to use that information, manipulate that information. So if your brain is not functioning, how do you even get any help out of therapy, out of even ordinary therapy? Forget about the stuff that we're going to talk about. Now, uh, obviously, my thesis to you is this, that we need to be involved as, an, as a community in retraining our brains. We need to be involved in making sure that the, the cognitive myopia that I talked about, the short-sightedness that is there in a lot of these patients are addressed. And, and unless we do that, we are not going to change the relapse rate. We're not going to change outcomes. And, and we should stop taking relapse as, a, as an outcome measure. This is a very blunt outcome measure. We should look at how even people do within the system that we, that we have. So it's easier, easier said than done. People are entrenched in the way that, they're, that they have been doing treatment. The question is, is this the right thing to do at this point in time when there's so much of an evidence base that we are looking at the problem of addiction in the wrong way? This is what I would put to you, that just Putting people in process groups is not going to make any change whatsoever. They're going to just cycle through treatment, and this is it. The emphasis needs to be on remediation of these deficits and reversal of these cognitive biases. If you address the core and enduring feature of the illness, you are going to get a different outcome. It is like, you know, the example that I would give is that you are treating the chest infection in a patient suffering from HIV. And then you're saying, well, the patient's better now. Right? You haven't addressed the core, and the chest infection came about because somebody's immunity is low. That is why they had, they had the chest infection in the first place. But we are, and I would put to you that we are not addressing the core and enduring feature of the illness, out of which all these behavioral problems then arise. So cognitive remediation. These are the assumptions that one makes that the cognitive processes can be vulnerable factors in, in relapse, that the people who are more impaired cognitively are more likely to, more likely to relapse. Now, when I was in medical school, we, we were taught, well, th the only two organs that reproduce themselves are the, is the liver and skin. They were so wrong. This is from, this is data that is from uh, Dr. Terrell, she is the head of the, uh, the, uh, a lab at King's College in, in London, and there is a very interesting TED talk on this I recently found, 
that about how people talked about neuroplasticity with after traumatic brain injury. It's the way that the brain reorganizes itself when one part of the brain is dead. And we've known that for some time. What is now evident is that we are looking at neurogenesis, growth of new brain cells, the growth of new brain cells in the hippocampus. And you can see this under an electron microscope. This is, this is not hypothetical. So neurogenesis can occur at almost any age. So it's not about just retraining the brain. And then you, we know that after about 27 or 28, there's a decrease in neurons. There's a slope that goes down. Uh, that's a downward slope. However, this, there is evidence now, and I won't go into these details, but I just want to tell you this, that we can regrow neurons at any age. And that is the current evidence in terms of the research that is, that is there. And, and she shows factors like what are the negative factors, the wrong diet, obviously aging, but stress, sleep deprivation, then learning exercise, enrich environment, and the right diet gives you a better thing, uh, better chances of, of regrowing these neurons. So as I, as I end this, I want to talk about, I want to put to you, should there be a paradigm shift in the way we conceptualize the illness? Should there be a paradigm shift in the way we are treating our patients, given the evidence that is out there? Are we looking at the wrong thing and that's why we've got it, we are getting it so wrong. That is why our relapse rates are, are so high. That the therapies that, that modify working memory uh, and other brain function and cognitive rehab, uh, rehabilitation or remediation might be able to change the cognitive uh, impairment that we, that we see in, uh, in addiction. These two slides show us that if you start doing cognitive remediation with skills training, that these are days of continuous drinking. As you can see, people with, there's a significant difference here. Um, people with skills training um, uh, have a much lower number of days of continuous drinking. This is when they're out in the community. Um, and then the number of drinks consumed, again, people who have had cognitive remediation this is the data that's telling us that we are actually making a, a significant difference by altering brain function and the days that are drunk, if you like. So again, all of these data show us that not only do they drink less, they're less drunk, and they are drinking much less frequently. So outcome is really important. So what do we do to enhance outcome? So the potential targets our cognition, people have tried pharmacotherapy, I won't go into that, but it doesn't, it hasn't worked so far. So the only thing we have is how can we improve brain function via these means, sorry, um, that, we, that we currently have. And then the question is, what should we be doing in terms of our treatment modality um, and things like TMS for addiction are uh, still uh, new things that Dr. Aquino uh, and her colleagues are, are, are looking at. Um, and these are the therapeutic strategies I would suggest that we might want to use apart from looking at the brain gym and various other things that uh, might, be, might be there. So in the context of addiction, I would say cognitive dysfunction and attentional bias along with decrease in memory and problems in working memory and forward planning uh, are responsible, I would, in, I would contend, both for the development of addiction, for the continuation of addiction, and unless we improve and change that, I would contend to you, we are not going to change our relapse rate. They will be just you know, revolving door patients. Okay, so the road to recovery is paved with good rehearsals. So rehearsing all these strategies uh, are really important. And I think that that is why so at Sovereign, we are walking that walk in terms of how do we, Dr. Millet and, and Dr. Spitz are spearheading the, uh, uh, the detailed quantitative EEGs and neurofeedback. And remember, we are not a high-end private pay center. 
99% of our people are on insurance. So we serve middle America. All of you, for all of you, it'll be possible to do this. I'm not telling you something that is done exclusively in a private pay clinic that, uh, that is high end. We, as I said, we have train drivers from Amtrak. We also have judges that come into, uh, into treatment. So we treat, and, and almost all of this on insurance. And there are ways we hope that we would be able to disseminate which will raise the bar and which will allow us to really make a difference. So enhanced outcome in addiction requires changes in both control and automatic processing, and we've talked about what it is. And the emerging cognitive biases uh, can be reversed with proper treatment. Um, and so the, to maximize these, these I, obviously these need to be easily available, and we hope that at, you know, from Sovereign, we are able to give you those tools, automated tools that you can use in your treatment centers as well. That will allow you to both measure how people are doing and secondly, to treat these cognitive deficits uh, completely. Uh, and then I think we would then be able to say, and this is my contention to you, that we are at par, that we have actually achieved parity in terms of how, uh, in terms of a speciality, in terms of how we, uh, how we are assessing and treating our patients. So thank you for your time. Thank you.